Welcome everyone to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. I'm your hostess, Monique Ramsey. And today our episode is called The Past, Present, and Future of Breast Implants. And my guest is our surgeon, Dr. John Smoot. Welcome, Dr. Smoot. Thank you. Glad to be here today. So we're not going to call you old because then we'd be calling me old too, but you started practice in 1990, which was really the same year that Connie Chung did a, this landmark broadcast on Face to Face, which warned about the dangers mm -hmm. of all these old silicone breast implants. So you've seen a lot. And really today, what we want to do is sort of get your take on the things that you've seen over the three decades plus of breast surgery. That sound okay? Yeah. Well, actually, I started in 1988. Okay. I okay. came here in 1988, spent two years in Houston doing my training. So I've got a few years under my belt. <laughs> okay. Yes. So and, uh, I did I did surgery with Dr. Cronin, the original, and uh, did implants with him and his nephew, who at the time were doing it. So I was learning from one of the very fierce pioneers in breast uh, augmentation surgery. So if we go back to like, let's go into the history, sort of the history books of, you know, some of the milestones in breast implants. So in the 1940s, we read, we did a little digging, Japanese prostitutes would inject their breast with paraffin, sort of a non-medical grade silicone, believing that that would entice American servicemen. Can you, what do you, is that, have you heard that? Oh, absolutely. Back in those early 50s, that was kind of the thing I was doing. And then injectable silicone came around, and I, I saw quite a few patients who had that done. And at the time, it thought like, well, it's an inert substance. It's going to do fine. It enhances their breasts, and they do look good initially. But what we found out 20, 30 years later, that those things formed granulomas, and they'd work to the, out to the skin and become open wounds and became a huge problem with term, determining, is it silicone or is it a tumor? And that quickly fell out of vogue in the 60s and 70s. And then we started putting in, I think it was in the exact date, late 60s, I think, when Dr. Cronin and Giroux put the first implant in. And they were all silicone, but there were many different ways, silicone, saline, paraffin. Uh, there's been all sorts of different uh, numerations of, of implants through the years. But basically, the one that won out was the silicone implant followed by the saline implant. So that's, yeah, in our in our history, it, he invented that breast implant in 1961. And then in 1962 was that very first Houston lady named Timmy Jean Lindsay. She was the first woman to get those breast implants. So quite, quite a little pioneer mm -hmm. for us. And so when you were training with him, was that the biggest part of his practice, breasts? Well, Dr. Cronin, excuse me, was a little bit older at that time. He was in his 80s, oh, oh. but he was still practicing. Uh, but we still were doing implant surgery. The other associates of his were ones who taught me how to do this. But yes, I saw some of his early work and that came in and saw some of the problems associated with it. But mostly at that time, we were using the Dow Corning Silastic 2 implant, Silastic 1, Silastic 2 implants. And that was such a remarkable thing because it was so soft and it felt so natural. Uh, but the problem we had is that it had a rupture rate of about 90% after about 10 years. Wow. So they didn't last very long. And with the older silicone, that's the one that gave us all the problems. Because that silicone wasn't the kind of silicone we use today. It was more of a liquid. It looked like molasses is really what it looked like. Oh. And that, when it ruptured, it got into the tissues, it got into the muscle, and became essentially just like you were injecting silicone into the, and became quite a problem to get it all out. And once it got into the tissues, it became quite problematic. Oh, I bet. And it was it because the shell of the implant would break down so easily or... Yes, the, the shells were very poorly made. I say poorly made. They weren't as strong like we do today. The shells that we have today are much better in terms of their strength and longevity. And we still see ruptures occasionally, but we don't ne nearly see the problems we had with those early uh, Dow Corning implants. And hence, that's where the, all the trouble started. And when you would, and so was that sort of in the 70s or the 80s, more the 80s or the early 90s? Like when were those people coming in who had had those maybe those Dow Corning implants that were starting to have problems? 
Well, that was that the late eighties. We were seeing that, and that's why you say when that big hubbub with Connie Chung came up about what those implants are doing and they're breaking, rupturing, and getting into the tissues. That's when the FDA stepped in in 1992, banned them. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there were problems. There's no question about it. But it, and the only implant we could use at that time then was the saline implant. It's the water-filled implant. And you know, by being new in my practice, that was a lot of my practice, and it's just. It was kind of devastating to those of us who lived off that for a while. We didn't have anything much. We didn't have much to do. Well, and they were talking about, you know, that in the 70s, the safety concerns about silicone were starting to emerge. And, you know, nowadays we would think, okay, well, what, what, what was, where was the FDA in all this? And were they, you know, did they review medical devices for safety? Mm-hmm. And do you know much about well, their involvement back then? Oh yeah, David Kessler. He he became quite notorious for what he did. They they basically just had a knee jerk reaction with this. Yes, there were problems, but they just basically banned them out completely, saying all these problems and that we were causing these these problems, autoimmune diseases, and problems with them. And so when they shut it off, then we still had to and and. Rightly so, we as plastic surgeons did not have the research to back up what we thought. Mm -hmm. And so, all right, so we had to acquiesce to what the FDA had to say about it. Then after 1992, and it was, what, 14 years later, after hundreds of tests and hundreds of researches, research projects, it came up to show there really wasn't a correlation between silicone implants and autoimmune diseases. So that's why we got them reinstated in 2006 to be able to use again. But in that 14-year period, all we could use was saline implants. Right. And, you know, again, and I guess early on, the FDA wasn't even reviewing medical devices at all prior to, you know, like in the 70s. They weren't, I guess these implants weren't really regulated. And um, so... You know, I don't want to stay in the back 40, 50 years ago because <laughs> you weren't practicing medicine, but, mm-hmm. you know, going into the, the 90s. So it was kind of interesting when I when I looked at, you know, you starting your practice really almost at the exact same time that all of this is coming to a head. And, you know, that program exactly. with Connie Chung and you're, you know, getting board certified and it's all sort of, and, and then you've had this... Um, specialization on breast surgery and really complications with breast surgery. And so now, do you remember when you were taught in in training, like what was kind of, if you take us back and paint a picture of, you know, what was it like when you were going through training, what were they teaching you about breast implants? Well, it hasn't changed that much. I mean, it was still, do we put them above the muscle? Uh, We put them below the muscle. Um, what type of things we do to help prevent capsular contracture, because that was a known complication even back then. And a lot of modalities were tried and things were tried to help reduce that, but it didn't really change things a lot. We did learn along the way that there are some things that positively do cause problems. That's blood in, in the pocket, contaminants, you know, stuff on your gloves. You know, so we have to have very clean, sterile fields. Any type of contaminant can sometimes cause a capsular contracture. We don't know everything that caused them. But, and that was a known known problem. But the problem was dealing with those ruptured silicone implants. That was, that was always a mess when you got into there. It was very hard to remove. It got on everything. Your instruments, getting it out of the patient was difficult. So, you know, I wasn't sad to see those Dow Corning implants go away. <laughs> and back in terms of the women and, and the popularity of breast implants, was that sort of, was it mainstream at that point and the, the demand? Oh, yeah, it was. Yes, there was quite a demand even back then. Um, and when I first started my practice in 1988, the first four years, that was probably 50, 60 percent of my practice was doing implant surgery. And I was well trained. I did a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And so that was the bulk of my practice. The other things like facelifts and liposuction wasn't as big as a thing back then, but that was the bulk of what we did. It was a lot of breast surgery. And that just overnight in 1992 just went away, you know, and yeah. just, you know, half your income, half your practice just goes away immediately. Right. That was for the guys that were well-established, like my brother who was well stead they, they were doing other procedures, so it didn't affect them as much. But those of us that were just starting out, yeah, it was a big whack to us all of a sudden. 
Now, did you have anybody in your immediate friends or family who got breast implants? No, uh, not that I knew personally or it was related to me. No, we didn't. I didn't have that oppor- opportunity to do that. But uh, I remember thinking when I first came into practice that, you know, putting implants in was such an easy thing. I remember my very first case, it didn't go well. <laughs> and it humbled me very quickly. They said, you've got to really pay attention to what you're doing. And, you know, even though I'd seen several hundred in my training, and you came out and there's no mentor there with you anymore. So you're all on you. It, Kind of made me wake up to pay attention to what I was doing, and I got good at it. I was I did a lot of those surgeries, and I think that you know the big problem was was the scare they gave women mm-hmm. in 1992. Just scared them to death, and we had the same thing happen again here a few years ago with the ALCL and the textured implants, which you may get into later. Yeah, yeah, I've got that. But, on our- you know, it's kind of say talking these women off the edge here, like, "Oh, am I going to die? What's going to happen?" You know, and. You know, Dow Corning had hundreds of thousands of lawsuits on them, but it all kind of went away when we showed the science doesn't back up. Mm-hmm. But it, it scared a lot of women. It made a lot of problems. But I think because of it, though, we made improvements to our techniques. We made improvements to the the implants we put in nowadays. These new cohesive gel implants are what people call the gummy bear implants. Really have improved that. Yeah, they do fail occasionally. We have to remove them. But taking them out is so much easier. They don't get into the tissues it's it's just made life a whole lot easier for for us and for the patient. Yeah, and yeah, and that's what I was starting to allude to earlier is um in one of the podcasts you were talking about sort of in that 14 year period where there was that moratorium and everybody had to be entered into the study was that the manufacturers of the implants really started to up their game and say okay, what can we do to make these, you know, a better product for everyone. So, um now, and when when this all started, were you practicing in Houston at that time? No, I came right out here to San Diego directly right out of my training. And I joined my brother, Dr. Wendell Smoot, and Dr. Alexander. <clears throat> and so we practiced together for about four years. And then my brother and I uh, left the practice and started our own practice. And we were together about 20 years until he retired. Mm-hmm. Then I left and came down and joined La Jolla Cosmetic Surgery, our practice. Now... The in 1994, you mentioned there was like 20,000 lawsuits or more filed against Dow Corning, and in '95 they just filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> so whatever happened, you know, mm-hmm. inside plastic surgery practices between 1990 and 2006, like did everybody switch to saline for pretty much every case mm-hmm. other than the reconstruction? Well, all the legitimate doctors, yeah, they did. We just switched to saline. Demand didn't go away. And we were, and again, we got really good at putting saline implants through small incisions. Um, still did the same things we did before in terms of where we placed them. Uh, still did lifts and reductions and things like that. But it was just a, it wasn't a, it, the implant didn't feel as good. It was, was not as well as accepted. I mean, it did, it gave them a nice look, but, you know, saline implants just don't feel the same as silicone implants. And that's why, Ninety nine percent of what I put in now is silicone. Mm-hmm. And so, when that mentor memory gel and the trell kind of came out in like around two thousand six, that new generation of silicone. So, were you really on board with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The when that was the first gen, there was a several generations of it, mm. and but those cohesive gel implants really made a difference. And the fact that you know when they break, they just stays together. Mm-hmm. Even today, when you take them out, it just all comes out in one big piece. It doesn't come out like stringy molasses, which gets on everything. So and replacing an implant is, is nowhere near the problem it used to be. So younger surgeons who didn't deal with that have no idea how lucky they are. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Well, and I remember when those <laughs> came out, you could poke a pin in them, make a hole, and squeeze the implant, and the little something would pop out. And then you let go of that pressure and it would suck right back in. Like it wasn't going to detach. I think that's what they were trying to say. It's not going to break yeah, away. Yeah, it didn't. Uh-huh. Mm. Yeah, you would take a knife and slice it open, squeeze it, and it bulges out, and then it just comes right back together. It, it's cohesive. It stays together. It's sticky, so it doesn't get out of the, of the pocket. So we don't see the, the uh, material getting out into the tissues. A lot of times on uh, MRIs or mammograms, we'll say intercapsular rupture. 
of the implant. Well, that means that it's broken, but it's still contained within the scar tissue or the capsule. It hasn't got into the tissues. And that's the thing we don't see anymore. Mm. Now that w- you alluded to the ALCL. And so in 2017, this is kind of came into the, to the news of where they discovered a link between textured implants and ALCL. And so the first question, I guess, is are textured <clears throat> implants still available um, I think Allergan removed their textured implants from the market voluntarily, but is that something that still people use? Yes, there are doctors still use it, but and you said it in 2017, but we were on, onto this long before that came out. Oh. There was talk within the society that this was happening. Um, there wasn't a lot of good data on it. And then kind of when it broke, it kind of said, okay, now we've got to really pay attention to it. But it, it seemed to be related to textured implants, Allergan was the one who put most of them in, but it wasn't just Allergan implants. Mm. It was related to the textured silicone implants. Even if they had been textured implants had been removed years and had smoothed it in, there still was a correlation to them developing it. Now, you've got to put it in perspective. There's not that many patients that develop this. I mean, of the millions and millions of men put in, there's probably several hundred that develop this ALCL. I can't know the exact number, but it, it wasn't a it wasn't millions. Mm. People developed this, but it was enough that, you know, the alarms went off. Women got upset, felt we were deceiving them. We weren't telling the truth and we're saying far from it, but it wasn't something we could just do a quick test and say, yeah, you got it. You don't, Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't predict who was going to do it in my personal practice. I've seen one in the last 35 years. That wasn't what we call an ALCL. It's a, we call it anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It's a type of cancer that related to the t- capsule and the texture. I've only seen one. My, my partners have seen one or two. So it's a pretty rare complication or issue of having implants. But you know, if you're a woman, you have implants. Yeah, that brings brings it to your forefront. You need to know about it. Right. Right. Well, it's hard to to deceive people when there's no, when you may never have ever seen it before. And I think you know until mm-hmm. there's like there's this critical mass of data, you know, it's it's mm-hmm. a little hard to start to you know come up with what do we do about it because you don't even know how what's causing it. So the texture and what was the really the purpose of a textured implant versus a smooth? Okay. Well, the biggest problem we had in augmentation surgery was capsular contracture. In other words, the hardening of the breast, the hardening of the implant, which it felt, the implant doesn't get hard, but the scar tissue around it forms an envelope and tightens and constricts it, making it feel firmer hard. And it was like we know some things cause it, but we couldn't always determine it. And if we could figure out ways to lessen that problem, then we'd have to deal with it less. Now, some of the earlier things were textured implants. Some was a polyurethane-coated implant, um, but that was pulled off the market because they had some supposedly cancer-causing uh, breakdown products. And we never found that it did that, by the way. But that was the th- idea, was to keep the breast soft. <clears throat> um, I don't know the exact data on that, but I think that it did help, but not a, not a lot. Mm. So kind of jump-forwarding, excuse me, <laughs> jumping forward to the present. So now today there's so many choices and more coming all the time. And so if you could kind of walk us through, what are the different variations of breast implants now? And what what do you tend to prefer and why? Okay. Well, there's a lot out there, but the majority of them are are silicone-based. There's basically two companies, Allergan and Mentor, the big manufacturers, and then Sientra is another one. Um, there's some other saline implant companies uh, that are out there. <clears throat> I think there's some European brands that are not FDA approved here in this country. But those are the main companies. Now, um, the saline implant is a saline implant. It's just water filled. The bag is the same with a, with a sectured, with a silicone filled implant as a saline filled implant. The advantage of a saline implant is that it's if it breaks, you know immediately you can fix it. Mm-hmm. Disadvantages, if you thin out, you can get rippling visibility and feels like a bag of water on the chest. Or the silicone implant, when you give them the two and they feel them, they almost always say, yeah, I want the silicone. It feels more natural. Mm-hmm. And there's different variabilities within the silicone in terms of the cohesiveness uh, or the thickness of it. Because some you'd want to be very soft, malleable. Some you want a little more form, less distortion when they stand up or it's on end. And that for those some of those patients that are very thin, 
and you want to keep the implant shape, you want a little more cohesive implant. The, the thickness of the silicone is higher. And then you've got on top of that, right? They get to think about profile, I guess, or, you know, teardrop or mm-hmm. round or, and, ha- and then I guess, does that make any difference? Well, that's the two different kinds. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, they, yes, there are, they're, they're called anatomical teardrops, but supposedly give a better slope of the upper pole. Um, I don't know. The studies I've seen where they double-blinded doctors and looked at them and said, which one's round, which one's teardrop? It was 50-50. So I never, my, this is my personal belief on this, is that it's not so much the shape that matters, it's the volume. Because mm. if you don't get the volume right, they won't care about the shape. <clears throat> so I don't think the advantages uh, of having a textured uh, anatomical implant outweighs the 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 problems you might see long term with ALCL, and that's the reason why I stopped using it. Uh, albeit it's a far, it's a very small problem, but it's just not worth the hassle and worry of these patients knowing they have that implant. Well, and I think you know if we get down to it, you know, breast implants are like the most studied, scrutinized medical device in the history of medical devices. You know, there have been so many studies. So when you look at, you step back and you look at the big picture, yeah, there have been, just like with anything, there are some people who will have an an effect that isn't desirable or, you know, have a complication from it or, you know, but as I think what's what point you made earlier with millions and millions of patients, you know, the number of cases of some of these complications is very, very small. And that's kind of a good thing to keep in perspective. That's right. There they weren't many of these out there, but they're there. And rightly so. We need to be um, forward thinking and being advocates for the patients and saying, okay, we need to disclose all these things. These are potential problems and have them well educated. So in all our consults, we need to go, we do talk about these things, about the potential problems, and and that's what we're going for with this, Mm -hmm. okay? Now, like everything, you know, breast implants, or I should say breast sizes and shapes, there's trends over the years of, you know, larger, smaller, Mm -hmm. natural, very in your face. (laughs) think of the 80s, Pamela okay. Anderson. Well, that's true. Right? So can you kind of take us in your practice from that point of view? How has the style changed over time? Well, initially it was, it was, you know, kind of just get something done to fix them to have some type of fullness around us. And then it kind of, you know, go bigger or go home. We got to that point where getting very large imprints was the, the trend. Um, then when all the problems started up, it started to trend away, and then it came back. Now it's trending back to, to much smaller. Uh, I don't see a lot of women having a lot of big amps. Occasionally you see them wanting to have big fake breasts, and that's okay if that's what they want. That's not what we advocate. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that at this stage of my practice, now I'm seeing all these ladies come back in their 60s and 70s saying, yeah, they're nice, but I want them out now. I, they, I don't need them any longer. You know, they're not doing what I want them to do. And as I say, the fantasy's over, and I just <laughs> want to feel better and get the weight off. And uh-huh. and that's usually what I see. Now, that doesn't. We haven't mentioned it, but now we got the wrist implant associated illnesses problem that are showing up again. A very nebulous issue where women are saying their implants are causing their fatigue, their hair loss, their immune disorders. They're not doing well, and this is the cause. And there are guys out there that are spouting these theoretical causes, but there's no data on this to show this is what's causing it. So my partner does a lot of that, the explant registry uh, where you're doing the block resections. and But the data doesn't show that that makes any more difference than just removing the implant. But because it's out there, and this is what these websites are talking about, it's saying you have to have these end block resections. And even that's a misnomer. That's not correct. End block means you're taking breast tissue with it. But we're talking about is end block removing the capsule and implant together. Mm-hmm. Now, and, and I, so that's been a, a big issue with. 
Well, I, you know, I was talking about this with another surgeon who's now retired, Dr. Lori Saltz. And she said, you know, I, I, because she was really in the camp of, if we can't prove it's doing something harmful to you, having another surgery, there's risks that go along with another surgery. And she said, but you know, I, I came to the realization, you know, you, there was no medical necessity to put them in other than you wanted them in. So I shouldn't worry if you want them out, that's okay too. And so she kind of got over the, right. the, where's the proof, you know, but and it was like, well, okay, if you want them out and that makes you feel better, great. And um, so mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting because especially as scientists, you all want to see the proof, right? <laughs> Why are we doing Correct. something exactly right. invasive mm -hmm. if we don't know that it's going to help? And I think that's and the big question. That was right. And that's what we thought. Are we doing something just because the public thinks we should be doing something? Is it medically necessary? Have these these women that have set all these problems, have they done an injustice on this woman by scaring them to death mm -hmm. and saying, I have to have my implants out instead of looking at the, the data? And I, most of the women that come in, they're knowledgeable of it. They know about it. But they're also pretty pragmatic about it, too. And you know, they understand what it is, and that is a risk. <clears throat> but, you know, when it, initially when it came out, it was, like I said, <clears throat> a lot of patients called and said, what am I having? This, am I going to have this problem? Do I need to have my implants out now? No. And so it, 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 we created it. You know, I know Dr. Saltz. I know her very well. She she felt like we were just doing a surgery just to placate this, this scare, mm -hmm. not because it was based on good science. Yeah. So now some of the innovations as we go into the future, you know, the re in the recent years, and I mean, not just a couple of years, longer time than that, but I can think of like the Keller funnel. And if you can talk about what that is and why that came into being. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> let's go back a little bit here. Now I talked on a previous podcast about the things we do to help um, take care of capsular contractures and to alleviate them and, and when they do occur. And I, because I've, I'm a little older in my practice. I'm seeing women who've had implants for 20, 30 years, and they've had multiple problems. How do you fix those problems? And I talked about grafts and the importance of putting grafts into keeping them soft and natural. Well, one of the things that we wanted to do to help prevent those to begin with is how you put the implants in. So we've come up with our society. It's not me, but their society's come up with what we call a 14-point program mm -hmm. where how you have to prepare the pocket, how you touch the pocket, you don't touch the implant with your hands ever. You're irrigated with antibiotics. You change your gloves and you put antibiotic in the pocket. All those things to decrease the potential contamination that may cause a capsular contracture. But even doing that, we still have about a 5% capsular contracture rate. And everyone's a little different, but that's, but it does seem to help. Also, the placement of the scission uh, was very important. I used to do a lot of incisions around the nipple or relay. And I had a lot of capsular contractures. And when I changed it and went down underneath the breast, that those capsular contractures really went down. And I saw much fewer of those by doing just changing those small techniques. So the killer funnel was just meant to a way to insert the implant without ever having to touch the implant. And is that something you use currently? I do all the time. All the time. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I never touch the implant. But I don't have to. I mean sometimes you have to, but if you try everything you can, and the, the funnel is just like a, a pastry funnel, and it's the same principle. You apply pressure at one end, and it slides through a small opening and and squeezes through the small hole and gets into the into the pocket without having to be touched. We used to have to use our fingers and stuff it in there, <laughs> which allowed for more contamination. Right, right. And then you mentioned stratus, and if I think that's another innovation that we've seen, and I know we did a whole podcast on kind of secondary augmentation or, and so stratus is something we talked about in alloderm and, mm -hmm. um, yes. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been yeah, using those? Those were called, well, I've been, I, I started, I was probably one of the first ones, not the first one, but very early in the development of what we call uh, ADMs, adermal, acellular dermal matrices. Basically it's collagenized tissue and we have human collagenized tissue and porcine collagenized tissue. Uh, both work very well. Once the, the porcine type is much less expensive, the human is what you use in reconstructions because insurance will pay for it. 
but to use it in cosmetic surgery, which is cost prohibitive. But it works very well in terms of preventing that capsular contracture. And I had the fortunate uh, situation where all my brother's patients who came in 20, 30 years later with all these problems and thinking they could never have nice looking breasts again and really making some marked improvements with them and improving their lives immensely. So yeah, I got a lot of experience with it. And we're going to send Gretchel, our wonderful videographer who's on vacation right now, but we're going to send her into the OR with you on a couple of these cases so that we you can really show and talk about you know, what you're mm-hmm. using and why and how it helps um, because mm-hmm. you're the master at that. And then, you know, something more common lately, I guess, or people are at least talking about, and you'll have to tell me how common it is in your practice, is fat transfer to the breast. And is, you know, okay. for adding a little shape, maybe. Okay. Yeah, there's, there, there's several variations of that. Mostly what we learned for fat grafting is from our reconstructive partners. Women have had mastectomies and breast tissue taken out. And adding fat just created a better shape instead of a half-dome look. And adding fat does a very good job of doing that. But using fat just for an augmentation doesn't work real well. You can get some improvements, but it's maybe a half a cup improvement. So rarely we just use fat for strictly augmentation purposes. But there's another thinking that you would do the, the composite breast, where you put a... Just say the woman needs a a 400 cc implant. Well, what if we put a 200 cc implant and put 200 cc's of fat? Hmm. So it's a cosmetic. Now this hasn't really caught on, but that's as an idea. So if you think of a pyramid, you're pouring sand on a pyramid. That's kind of what you're doing. So the base rounds out nicely, and you have a better shape. But again, so there's a cost factor in that having to harvest the fat. You have to have the fat to begin with. Mostly what I use fat for is for contouring deformities. You know, one's a little flatter. We need a little more volume here and just kind of more of a camouflage. That works very well. So kind of the icing on the cake, I guess, you know, to make it yeah. pretty, right? Yeah. For people who need it. And when like uh, a contour deformity, what would you mean? Just well, um, let's just say they have a dent somewhere in the upper breast or on the side of their breast, um, or there's a scar that's pulling underneath the nipple. By releasing that, putting fat in there, you can sometimes correct some of those irregularities with fat. That's usually what I use it for. And, okay. Um, now, I guess everybody who has a breast implant eventually will need to have it replaced. And so then that... No. No. Oh, really? No, that's okay. not correct. That is, oh, okay. This is this is the big this is the big misnomer that comes out there is that it's, they think that for some reason years ago the implant company says you should have them replaced every ten years. That's still out there. That is not true. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> and that's the montage here is that you do not want to do something that you don't need to do. It's not like every so often. You need to have them replaced. But the problem is with these newer implants, you can't tell when they need to be replaced. Mm. You can't look at them. You can't feel them. With some advanced tests, with some specialized ultrasounds or an MRI, you can detect a rupture. And if they are broken, yeah, that should be replaced. But, you know, some of these implants will go 30, 40 years and do just fine. But that's the thing that, you know, you don't have to come in every 10 years and get warranty work. I still see that today. (laughs) <laughs> That's funny. Well, and I think maybe because I do remember they did have like a ten year warranty, and maybe that ten year warranty, like that the you know Allergan or who at Mentor is going to say for ten years we'll replace them if they fail. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe then that got morphed mm-hmm. into every ten years I have to have them. So, so if you've had them for twenty five or thirty years and you're not having issues, would you just say you're you're good? Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Yeah, don't don't mess with it, or get get an MRI and see if it's broken. Um, most of the time, if they come in and I say, "What do you think?" I said, "You look fine. Don't mess with it. Uh-huh. It's going to be a, it's going to have a very nice result." Because here's something that it's hard to teach patients. This is the adage: the enemy of good is better. Mm-hmm. When they want a little something done or a little improvement, you sometimes you get in there and you things don't turn out like you want. And you think, "Why did I ever touch this?" So there's got to be a good reason to do something. 
just to do something because you can do it, that it's not good medicine. It's not, doesn't make good sense. Right. So looking into the future, I found an article about tissue engineered 3D printed implants. Have you heard about these? Yeah, but I don't know much about it. So okay. I, I wouldn't <laughs> well, I don't want think to comment anybody, on it. I, I don't think anybody um, does yet because they're just starting to use them. Mm. Do you foresee any other advancements in breast augmentation coming soon? Well, there, I think there's some things that we're learning, some techniques that we're learning. As I, I looked at what some of these other doctors are doing around the country, one of the which is with the new techniques of instead of going strictly below the muscle or above the muscle, is calling a subfascial augmentation. It's a little trickier to do, but it can be done. And with using some of these techniques, it 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 may work very well for reducing the capsular contraction rate and reducing the animation deformity when you go under the muscle. Because when you put on the muscle, when you flex, it moves. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen some good work on that coming out, so we may be doing more and more of that as we go down the road. Uh, I think the implant craze is pretty much over. You still will do it, but not like it was in the early 2000s where people were just running in and just throwing their money down to have them put in. Uh, (laughs) So there's some things on the future I think will show, and it's just these techniques are getting better and better, and you know, trying to keep abreast of them, no pun intended, um, <laughs> to learn these things and these techniques is, is you know, I do enjoy that because I don't think I've got a corner on the market for that. And usually some will come up with a good idea. But the, uh, the thing is, it's got to be proven. And right. I usually won't do something until it's been around for a few years. And, okay, okay, you did it. Now, does it work? Let's see what it looks like two, three years from now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not just after surgery, but in 10 years time or, you know, because sometimes these mm-hmm. things don't manifest for a little while. And so I I think part of why I love working with you and with the, the surgeons at La Jolla Cosmetic is they don't jump onto every new trend. You know, you mm-hmm. guys very carefully vet any new technology you bring in, any device, you know, it's all about, well, is this really... Is this the latest craze or is this something that's really going to benefit the patient? And that kind of right. ethics is is so important. Yeah. If it's good today, it'll be good tomorrow. And if it's good tomorrow, I'll use it. <laughs> and that's, you've, you've got to have the proof's got to be in the pudding. And, you know, a lot of techniques, a lot of these new devices are coming out. It's so wonderful. I said, well, let's see what it looks like two or three years. And are they still talking about it then? Because a lot of times there's a big flash in the pan and then, that eh, doesn't work. And we've all been down that road where we've got sold something to do something and that uh, didn't work. Uh huh. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smoot, for joining us today and doing this sort of like little walk down memory lane of the breast implant and where it's come and where it's going. Um, you know, having, having your, um, wisdom and your, uh, just all your experience, you know, over three decades, like you said, 35 years is, that's a lot of breasts. <laughs> and you to be able to yep. you know, share with the audience that, you know, kind of where we are. And if you were to sort of sum up, you know, what you think about breast implants now, you know, what, what would that be? It would be simply that it's not going away. It will still be a demand for it. I think a lot of women define their femininity by their shape and how they look. And most women come in not because their boyfriend wants or husband wants it. They want it. They want to feel better. They want to look better. So that's never going to go away. I think some of the crazes, you know, big breasts, you know, big implants is going to, that's kind of gone gone away. It may circle back at some point. But now it's it's more in terms of just that and looking at the whole health of the person. And, and breasts are just one small portion. I mean, the big ticket item now and out there is mommy makeovers. Now, you're not only doing breasts, but you're doing tummies and backs and flanks and thighs and, and shaping completely. That's really the big one out there right now, but it's a lot of work and you've got to be very careful who you do those on. So that's kind of where I see it going. It's, and I think as we refine our techniques, we'll still get better outcomes. Um, I think that you know experience will always trump knowledge in the sense that someone who's been there and done that and done these things I'll always have a better handle on how to handle these problems. That seems the bulk of what I see now are all the problems coming back. (laughs) 
yeah, mine as well as many others. Right, right. Well, and and hopefully in 20 years from now, surgeons won't be dealing with really complex hopefully, because maybe these implants that we're currently putting in are so much better than the ones from 30, 40, 50 years ago. I think you're right. We're going to see fewer problems, but they're not going to go away. But it's still going to be a better technique, a better approach. Um, I'm I'm really proud of our society for being proactive and trying to research these and learn and do things that will really enhance the beauty and and overall, overall well-being of our patients. And that society, which one are we talking about? The, the, um, the, there's two uh, societies, this American Society of Plastic Surgery and the American Aesthetic Society of Plastic Surgery. Both entities are, are focused on doing good work. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Smoot. And everybody, you can find in the show notes how to reach us. And, and if you would like to talk to Dr. Smoot about either a, a first-time breast augmentation or a revision to a or a potential revision that you might not need. He'll let you know. (laughs) So it'll be all in the show notes. Take a screenshot of this podcast episode with your phone and show it at your consultation or appointment or mention the promo code podcast to receive $25 off any service or product of $50 or more at La Jolla Cosmetic. La Jolla Cosmetic is located just off the I-5 San Diego Freeway in the Zymed building on the Scripps Memorial Hospital campus. To learn more, go to ljcsc.com or follow the team on Instagram at ljcsc. The La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.